Okay, there we go. Let me get let me get some chatter from you, gentlemen. Check, check. One, two, three. I'm checking Janet, with Janet, you right Janet, now. Janet, no podcaster, no podcaster, no podcaster. <laughs> yeah, yeah. All right, now we're now we're talking. Man, yeah. Is that, is, what is my video just that big? Because that's not the way it looks on my camera. Um, I mean, I can. Uh, well, yeah. I mean, Tom, you have to come to grips with the fact that you have a a head larger than Brian's entire large. torso. That's yeah. uh. Uh, well, here, can you position Can you position your head kind of in the center. middle? There you yeah, go. Here. Then we could do that. That works. Hello. Yeah. Hello. Hello. Right ho. Governor. Okay. So right. is the Justin chat room the best chat room to look at? Uh, us- well, uh, usually unfiltered is where everyone gravitates to oh, okay. during this. I can, I that, can unfilter. We, some- we say, we say, het. That is, that is a, a, a no chat. The, the, the weird thing's podcast recording is a is a bubble yeah we don't we don't respond to the chats we try not to look at them yes try very hard oh should i not look at them well that's what we want to lose ourselves in the conversation obviously we all we're very interactive people all right screw you people yeah i'm out not looking at you okay this is one of those this is one of those things we just want to we want, we want to give them a, a taste of, of us in our natural habitat. Oh, okay. So I'll just... <laughs> Yes. Yes. Off with the clothes. Exactly. Okay. Here we go. So, okay. I'm definitely peeking you out on this. Check, 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 check. Exactly. Okay. Here we go. So. Oh, that's definitely the wrong mic. Wow. That would have been a disaster if we had that recorded would have certainly the Certainly been the worst episode ever. <laughs> it would have been. There's a number of things I was going to say is going to be worth worse than, and I'm glad I said none of them. Worse than Hitler. Oh, that was only the beginning. Oh, no. test, test, test. All right, let Leon me hear. Leon Hitler just is a fantastic that. sandwich artist. <laughs> All right, uh, Tom, let me yes. hear some chatter. Hey, Brian Brushwood, this is Tom Mary, and I'm going to say weird things about stuff. All right. I probably, I probably oh, won't talk like that, but I'll talk test, like this. Test, test, test. All right, let Leon me hear. Leon Hitler I just is a fantastic that. sandwich artist. <laughs> oh. And I, I like his bologna. He's uh, a great, I'll tell you what, only the purest. <laughs> Makes a great Polish sausage. <laughs> he does. All right, one more, one more time. Work. I, I don't like it when he moves into Russian food. No, it's a mistake, to, and he knows it. We know it. Well, he spends too much time in the freezer, right? He's like, yeah. he's like, I'm gonna get that Russian, and then he just goes in there, and it's like he's frozen solid back yeah, in there. He yeah. walks out. But he's, what? He's, he's really good he partnering up be... with Italian restaurants and d- does some. <laughs> God damn it, Tom! You, you you beat me to it. We were rushing <laughs> to the same joke, and you, and you snatched it up, and here I am left. Broken hearted. You could have mentioned sushi. That opened up next to him and just like rolled over and gave him half the restaurant without even like <laughs> trying to compete. <laughs> oh, Leon Hitler. What a scamp. All right. We are recording. We're ready. All right. Uh, all right. Well, I'll, I'll run point. Uh, forward. So uh, here we go. Power, power, power guard, rear uh, defender, goalie. No, you're goalie. gonna play Brian. You're gonna play center okay. because that's funnier. Can can I be umpire? No, mm. you're gonna be. You're gonna wear a Kareem Abdul Jabbar jersey. Okay, and you're gonna be our center, including the rec specs. Done. I don't even know what that means. It sounded highly technical though, and it is. All right, here we go. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, welcome to the Weird Things <laughs> Podcast. That is a dog. Uh, Sorry, that is not the you, point of this show. You think it's a dog. That's just you do. The, maybe that's just the jumping off point. You ever see that's the how thing? weird this episode is? You have already understood uh, that this is a disorienting experience because normally it's Andrew Maine's dulcet tones that are uh, that are greeting you for this podcast. He is unfortunately unavailable. So today we are not only joined by Brian Brushwood. Hello. But also our special guest and dog wrangler himself, Tom Merritt. What's going on, buddy? Uh, thanks for having me back. It's, it's good to be talking weird things again. You know, ever since we made uh, the, the unholy pact uh, that we were going to do a Weird Things episode every week, uh, it, is, it is 
But not only the unintended consequence has been that we've been able to bring on some of our friends like Tom. If you are unfamiliar with Tom, seriously, there's nobody who's listening to this who's likely unfamiliar with Tom's work. Tech News Today, Sword and Laser, go check it out. But let's get right into the weird, gentlemen. Uh, We obviously, uh, all three of us are part, and we talk a fair amount about our, our movie leagues, our fantasy movie leagues that we play on NSFW and your show frame rate that you guys do together. Yeah. Um, yeah. What could, what would you think to be the most audacious movie advertisement you could possibly think? And now by that, I mean the, uh, one of those big, uh, you know, a big event, like remember for, uh, what was the soup chronicle? They had, uh, people flying what looked to be, like human bodies, like it was, it was a, a, a mechanical uh, device that they were flying around. And that was like a promotional opportunity for the film Chronicle where teenagers got superpowers and, and flew around. Uh, what would you think to be the most audacious one for a movie that you guys maybe enjoyed or are familiar with? Um, I mean, that's, I think that's the limitation, right? Is the ones that we know of, um, Man, I'm drawing a blank. Can, can, can I can I go to Google for this one and just sort of find go on a fishing expedition? Oh, come on, come on! Actually, All right, so, so I don't know. I don't know. Like I didn't even know about the Chronicle one. I didn't know there would be me, a pop quiz. <laughs> let me. Okay, listen. Brian, don't freak out here. Jesus Christ! It, it, we're I all here together. So uh, let, let's say, for example, uh, for for Blade Runner, if they were going to remake Blade Runner, you would have uh, maybe they would introduce a, 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 a some sort of big revolutionary AI or something like that, or they would so tie like in... ones that actually happened, is what you're saying. Yeah, no, 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 yeah. Let's just think of it. Yeah, no, they don't have to actually happen, no. I see. Okay. That uh, certainly makes things easier. Blue sky. But do you think I was putting you on, yes, on the spot? Well, I, and the reason I think that is because that's what you asked us. You asked us which is the most audacious in history, and no, then what, I was what, like, what, I don't what, know what, of what any. Be? I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Uh, we can check the tape, but I, I thought I made that clear. I did not. Upon further review, that's all I have. Oh, <laughs> you, only, you only got this set up. No, no actual punchline. Uh, all right. So let, let, let's see what's coming up around the corner. I think um, uh, I, I got one if you need a second. Oh, go. I, yes, by all means. Uh, World War Z. Okay. The, uh, the movie adaptation of the Max Brooks novel uh, all about the zombie war. Uh, it's, they've, they've changed quite a bit from the book, but I saw the trailer this weekend and it looks like it might be a decent zombie movie. If you just forget that it's based on the book and go in and watch it, I think because the whole point, the whole trailer focuses around, um, what's his name? Brad Pitt yes. in, yeah. in the car with his family and things start to fall apart. Downtown New York city, middle of rush hour. Two, three hundred zombies just start walking out Running. into traffic, beaten, beaten on cars. You d- uh, <laughs> and, 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 and then turns out that they're just trying to hand you pamphlets. You know what would be great? Saying, hey, we'll go see World War Z this weekend. You know what they should also the do so- is they should tie this moment like just after a popular local sports team either wins or loses <laughs> – in a major tournament of some variety. And then these quote unquote zombies could just really just tear stuff up the way zombies quote unquote would. You know, lighting yeah, cars they'll on be wearing fire. Yankees hats or something. <laughs> yeah, sure. <laughs> Rocking over cars, taking on taking on police officer and other authority figures. And it was all just promotion. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Go see World War Z. So you would say, all right, so let's say a huge uh, borderline or no, definitely illegal flash mob, or at least a flash mob for which, uh, uh, you know, the destru- destructive violence came from this gathering of. No, of human I, I'm beings. not calling for the destructive violence. I think Brian's saying that that would be a nice cover for you to get no, away okay. with. No, it's okay. I think in my original concept, that there just needs to be just kind of put the scare violence. into people. <laughs> borderline <laughs> illegal because of jaywalking, maybe, but that's exactly. Yeah. 
Uh, yeah, man. We'll see what other movies are coming out. We got, and it's got to be something big and kind of fantasy or. I mean, it could be of, of all of all time, and this is where this is where that of all time thing is. I want to do widen it even further, right. so it you wasn't know what? like well, just I, know, I, I thought what they did for Casablanca was pretty amazing. And uh, what was that? Wait, what did they do? They started World War Two. <laughs> World War Two. <II. laughs> They wanted it to be an alternate. Re- all of World War II was an alternate reality game. It was an ARG. Exactly. It was all an ARG. <laughs> Got a little out of hand, but but man, I'll tell you what. It really made the entire movie much more believable once Big once time. that had happened. Yeah. It was the beginning That's of a beautiful ahead. friendship. What about something like if they made another Terminator movie and in okay. secret, like let's say James Cameron comes back to Terminator, and because he's James Cameron, he invests. Millions. How, how would he sound like? And millions. What James? James Cameron. Let's see. He, that, that's how he sounds, right? I've seen him yeah. in interviews. But well, what? What would he say? Well, how, he would identify himself. Well, by his he, he would. He would say. He would say, "Hello, it's me, James Cameron. I'm calling you from the bottom of the sea in my submersive dirigible." <laughs> <laughs> and uh, see, I don't want to quite give him an English accent, but he just kind of shouts a lot. He's yeah. like, sure. I was thinking, I was thinking as I would want to reboot the Terminator franchise, I realized a thing. I have money. I mean, a lot and lot of money. What I'd like to do, and you'll have to take care of this for me, sirs, as I'm going to swim through the center of planet Earth out to the other side... I'm going to need you to actually build a functioning bipedal Terminator-like robot and set it loose on the streets of New York. <laughs> By the way, I do love that your James Cameron is a absent-minded inventor plutocrat. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I'm glad you. I'm glad you saw where I was trying to uh, end with uh, this. Like, Circa like, uh, 19, a, a Rockefeller age. Yeah. Yes. Doc- well, when you have this much money, you get to live in whatever time and place you see fit. As Mr. James Cameron, Cameron, I believe World War Z is uh, reserved the New York City streets for that that period of time. I'll tell you what, man. Talk about a crossover. We could have James Cameron's plutocratic uh, <laughs> Terminator robots try to subdue the uh, the zombies. I'm using the air quotes again after the sports yeah. game. Exactly. It's the 99 percent versus the one percent right there. <laughs> Bit large, the one percent of robots. Which, by the way, and the whole like, and, and sports fans obviously listen, like, and and they get a bad rap for doing stuff like that. But that's booze. If you let Twilight fans drink during uh, you know, Twilight, and that ended up in a way drink. that they didn't like it, they'd be flipping cars. <laughs> well, but that, but the sports fans are not flipping the cars because they didn't like the game. It's because they won. Well, no, but that's just so it, it would the, be the, like if the Twilight fans came out and were like. That was the best one I okay, ever. No, one, no. <laughs> ask, ask, ask Vancouver if that's only reserved for winning teams. Yeah, to that's riot the, it seems cities. like people like to riot whether they win or lose. They're like, sure, and sure, but I'm just happened. saying it's not. It's not. It's it's not. It's not based. Uh, it's based on the event happening, not the quality of the event. No, I, it's based on the quantity of booze consumed <laughs> that's times right. yeah, okay. how right. much they are into the the uh, the said event, be it sports or otherwise. Well, let me take party. this. The Detroit Tigers, yeah, uh, yeah, lost to the San Francisco Giants, and yeah. the Detroit people did not riot, even though they lost. But then again, if they the did, San did Francisco, the Hello, San Francisco jokes. <laughs> burned a couple buses. So you're saying that uh, San Francisco is worse than Detroit? Just you want to put that on the record? We'll just kind of throw I'm just that saying, out there. When you lose, you don't necessarily riot, no matter how much eight ball you've got in you. <laughs> I want that on a T-shirt attributed to Tom Merritt with sage words, sir. Now, funny you should mention the Terminator example, Brian, because during the la- the press for the last Iron Man, there were uh, demonstrations of like where we are, where military technology is. In uh, in in terms of of bionic suits and now, and what was, we're... was that was that an Iron Man tie? I mean, I know it was timed with Iron Man, but I don't think that was promoted by Iron Man. I thought it was like uh, McDonnell Douglas or um, uh, what's the other? No, it was a military? joint thing. It was oh, like was? like there was Iron Man two like logos on the stuff that they were. And then, but they, were but they got about. the guy from uh, from uh, Shield from the Avengers the. This yeah, Agent Coulson. Coulson? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. yeah. They had no, him. I think it was it was one of those things where it's like or they, they get Chuck in... Coulson from Watergate. They got Larry Coulson from from plumbing. <laughs> yes, 
Uh, I think it was one of the things where they probably brought in those guys. The plumbers the were also part of one. as like a uh, a consultant, and then wound up using that kind of stuff later. God, that's amazing. Like, okay, so yeah, that is a good example. Was that what got you thinking about this question? No. There's an even better one I'm sorry. on the horizon. It's, it sounds like, I'm sorry, so far we've heard about uh, zombie sports fans and uh, plutocratic Terminators. It sounds like you're saying there's something better. Listen, they're coming up, and this is happening now. Ladies and gentlemen, we are in the midst of quite possibly the greatest, most exciting press gathering and press learning event in the history of film. Rivaling that of the great Casablanca. <laughs> I was World about War to II. say, the bar's been set pretty high at this point. I'm a little nervous. <laughs> We're in the middle of it right now, you and I? Yes. Yes, all of us. Yep. Uh, Mount Rafu is in New Zealand. It is, in fact, a volcano. Go on. And as we return to Middle Earth, for The Hobbit, you might remember it as Mount Doom from the Lord of the Rings franchise. Wait, is it about to erupt? And it is about to erupt. Yes! That's pretty huge. Did no word yet if the Eye of Sauron will erupt from it. Did you also hear about all the animals that have died in uh, in New Zealand during the shooting of the Hobbit, well, yeah, I, I saw that people were upset about it, but I didn't see. I didn't know if they were like if it if it was legit. It, well, so they can can they not say no animals were harmed in the shooting of this movie? They most certainly cannot. And apparently, PETA is organizing a protest. Uh, Twenty seven animals, ranging from horse to sheep to other critters, uh, have died uh, allegedly because of um, what they say is uh, you know the shoddy conditions under which they're shooting, and which they don't mean like they don't have nice equipment it's just like you know the the ground that they're on is pitted and has holes so a horse is galloping and it you know drops a hoof in a hole and snaps its leg i i I don't pretend to know how this really works but i've heard like every other ignorant person out uh, out there uh that PETA is on site at films monitoring this stuff all the time and that's why you never hear of these sorts of things happening is, was that not true or is that just a myth i mean the the different reports let me see if i can actually find it in i mean i've news. heard it's really well, I mean, difficult right. to do I mean, anything with yeah. animals on a movie because you have to be so stringent about the conditions yes well in this case it says here uh wranglers say the hobbit animals died on an unsafe farm is what it is. This is from Boston.com. What is this? Walking Dead? Yes. This is the Walking Dead. <laughs> no, they said they died on a very boring farm. <laughs> so they, yes. to they died of boredom they watching died. season two of The Walking Dead. <laughs> because uh, nobody would do anything. Right. Well, no matter. Okay, listen. All these animals could have died from a gunshot wound uh, inflicted by a mad New or, Zealand. Or just guy. scrapey or something. Like, just happened to go through them. They were kept at a farm filled with bluffs, sinkholes, and other, quote-unquote, death traps. But Hilarious. it's a farm. Listen, we're, they're all going to die if the, crowd, the, the crater in Mount Raffo, <laughs> which is normally filled with snowmelt lake and a, uh, pecu- uh, has a peculiar temperature difference between the lake and the ground beneath it, and has led scientists to issue the warning that it will likely erupt. Dude, that's... And Peter Jackson's contract to deliver this movie can only be unmade there, PETA. <laughs> <laughs> I think you're right, man. I'm going to say that uh, getting a volcano to erupt probably tops, maybe maybe not the Casablanca promotion. <laughs> no, it comes but pretty darn close. Everything else. Yeah. Absolutely. Huh. How come nobody made a good Iceland movie when What's-Its-Face went off and grounded all the planes a couple of years ago? Oh, yeah, that's right, because the giant uh, cloud of ash all yeah. over Europe. Yeah. It could have been a comedy, Ash Hole. <laughs> when you go to Ice, the guy who accidentally, a Mr. Bean like figure who accidentally started the uh, volcano erupting by dropping pop rocks into the, it. And then the tagline is like, shove it up your Iceland. It's the Ash Hole. <laughs> who would be the Ash Hole? Who do you think would be the, the, the guy who accidentally starts the volcano? Well, he's got to be the Icelandic Ash Hole, right? 
Well, I mean, he could be vacationing. Literally, there's a million ways we can go yeah, with yeah, this. Yeah. We're selling the oh, script. Yeah, yeah, by can the can way. we make a Julian Assange just for no reason? <laughs> like, he's no, just like, he that's can where have a cameo though. That's where he's hiding. Like, like no, maybe but we could make it. Um... No, he goes to hide out, you, and yes, now Julian he's Julian Cope. Assange's roommate. Yeah. That's it. Okay. Like <laughs> so, so it ends up being like an odd couple kind of thing. It's Julian Assange and the Icelandic asshole. But we need we need an actor. Who do you think? Who's who's the asshole? Uh Seth Green. Seth Good. Seth Rogan. It's a good Seth Green Seth role. Seth Rogan. He can play embarrassed very well. <laughs> Ooh, or Seth why? McFarlane. You have to pick one of those. <laughs> Some kind of Seth. You got to pick one of those Seths. Pick a Seth. Any <laughs> Seth. Seth Rogen? Can we go Seth Rogen? Yeah. <laughs> That's a lot of smoke. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I guess I'm the ash hole. <laughs> <laughs> so does, I think does, we got it. Does Julian Assange play himself or do we get someone else for him? No, he's played by uh, uh, a former progressive rock artist, Julian Cope. <laughs> See, I was thinking like Bjorn Lumberg, the skeptical environmentalist. What? Why? Because <laughs> he looks vaguely like Julian Assange. And you just felt the need to make that connection here on the podcast. He's played by the corpse of Timothy Leary. Yeah. <laughs> there we go. Weekend at Bernie style animated. It's amazing what they can do with CGI these days. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, the Weird Things Podcast is brought to you by Flying DVDs of Death. It is a podcast that focuses on two things, kung fu movies and drinking. Go ahead and head on over there right now. Michael Walk, whose last name I consistently mispronounce, despite the fact that I've known him for over five years, uh, is the host of it. So go on, head on over to flyingdvdsofdeath.com or... Uh, you can go ahead and uh, and check it out on iTunes. Also, uh, they just did the We're Alive, a zombie radio play podcast. So check that out. When you say we're, is that we are alive? We're alive or like werewolves that are we, alive? No, no, like we are, like okay. the, the oh. contraction that, we are. I don't know, actually. Has anyone done a zombie, uh, a, a werewolf zombie movie yet? It's like what? Zombie like, werewolves? Like, so zombies would be running around. Uh, like somebody who's normal, but then the moon werewolf? comes out and they turn into a zombie. Yeah. Oh no, no. no. Or better yet, like uh, like they're zombies, but then they get bit by a werewolf, and then when the moon turns, like normally they just kind of shamble around and it's no big deal, and oh, then you, you can yeah. keep them outside the fence. But then, like every full moon, a few of them go were zombie mule. Where do they go? Is what they are. Uh, all right. Well, there <laughs> I we like go. it. If you'd like to uh, subscribe to, or sorry, uh, help advertise on the Weird Things podcast, go ahead and head on over to weirdthings.com slash sponsor. For some reason, the other day, because I was listening to some Warren Zevon, uh, I had the idea that like somebody should, or maybe there's a reason why they have not done a, a zombie version of Werewolves of London with, instead of the au part, do a... Uh, Zombies of Zombies London. Zombies of Georgia. Uh, I guarantee you that's going to be up in 20 minutes. <laughs> kind of like uh, uh, Jonathan Colton's Read Your Brains, right? I mean. Oh, yeah. Brains. Yeah. Zombies of Georgia. <laughs> it's Saw like a zombie we, with a Chinese menu in his I hand. I can't believe that hasn't happened because all you need is the karaoke track and then a bunch of clips from uh, Walking Dead. Like that's a way to just instantly cash in. Like if you see me, uh, for some reason, I had I had two musical related Walking Dead jokes that popped in my head. Gonna get a over big dish of beef chow brains. Well, because like, have you seen have you seen the Sound of Cylons? It's just basically someone rewrote the lyrics to Sound of Silence, and it, and it's not even like jokey or clever. It's just an accurate description of what happens in Battlestar Galactica. Yeah, with clips of Battlestar Galactica, and, and it's people got like, dig it. It's got like a half billion views. All right, so here's my other idea, and somebody can take it if they if they want. Uh, and you guys might be familiar with this trope. Man, we're but, like a free uh, gold factory right here. Why are we not right. bottling this stuff? Here's the deal. I say a bottle it. Uh, there uh, was a trend. Now it is kind of on the downward uh, after, like, Monday Night Football used to have the Are You Ready for Some Football song, right? Yeah. So when NBC 
got their Sunday night football package that for some reason they're like big football games have theme songs where people sing and they just awkwardly plug in like the names of the football teams that are playing each other into the lyrics. Uh, Wait, is that what they did with Are You Ready for Some Football? Oh, yeah. No, so th- th- it would all be the song in 90% of the song. And then it would be like, like the Dolphins D is getting ready to play. What the Bears O has their say. Like, you know, it was all like these stupid puns and it was all just like cam fisted. So when NBC got it, they sang. Um, they have Faith Hill singing. And it happens now every Sunday during football season. She sings like the NFL rocks on NBA. And so it's like, and it's the same thing. It's not, it's a terrible song. And she just like puts in these like stupid lyrics and everything. But I, for some reason, I, I just think that there is a YouTube channel to be had where you just do that exact same thing, except like on Fridays, you, you come out with your like walking dead, like, like the walking dead rocks on AMC, like is your, is, is the chorus instead of the NFL rocks on NBC. Now, can you, can you, uh, stick in like different major characters each time? Like, so yeah, you, no. You and so like- that's what you do is each, each week you see what happened on the last week's episode of the walking dead, ready to get, uh, you know, getting ready for this one. So it's like Herschel got bit and then we'll see what happens. <laughs> Like, like, governor's getting ready to do a rape in the night. Yeah, exactly. Hey, Jack, it's a fact. Governor's kind of weird. He's got a <laughs> wall full of heads, and Merle Dixon's got a beard. Oh, I, I was been doing some research. Did you know all my ra- rowdy friends are coming over tonight is the song that Are You Ready for Some Football is parodying. Wait, it's a parody? It's well, it's not a parody, but right. it's a rewrite of the lyrics of "All My Rowdy Friends Are Coming Over Monday Night." Yeah, is what they instead of tonight. Do you want a drink? Do you want a party? Ready to get the summertime started? Wow! Is the, are with, you ready for some with football? The, and that was Atlanta Falcons. Basically, yeah, and I don't know whether or not the what's it called? I don't know whether or not um, the the Faith Hill song is. And I think that's an original. That one's too terrible to not be written specifically for that. I can't imagine her actually writing something like that. So, so there we go. That I think there's if somebody has uh, a, a a vision for this and and finds it as funny as I do, I would watch it every single Friday. If somebody put together just ham fistedly rammed in plot points <laughs> from last week's Walking Dead and teased us to see what will happen in this week's Walking Dead. I'll in tell you what, the, it's, it's in the also, key of the NFL rocks on NBC. It's going to be one of those things, too, where every time it, it'll be each one will be released right at the height of anticipation for the new episode. So yeah. it'll become ritualistic that everyone pass them around. And because it's not something that'll go on forever because, you know, the series will will each season will come to an end. So it's like everyone will jump in right now. This is a brilliant idea. Hey Jack, it's that's like the like, oh the direct, no the, the Faith Hill song "Waiting All Day for Sunday Night." Oh no, yeah. is set to the tune of Joan Jett's 1980s hit "I Hate Myself for Loving You." Wow, so it's another just rewrite. So there we, yeah, and and that, is that you don't even change it. You are waiting all day for Sunday night, and, so, and bonus, Pink sang the song the first NBC season on Sunday Night Football, and then oh, they really? changed it to Faith Hill. Amazing! It's a good change. It's a good, she's got faith. Hill. It's she's a good done. change. I'm just it's a good change. <laughs> All right. So, what other weird stuff you got going on, Justin? Um. Well, you want to know what, guys? I'm tapped out. I had one topic. <laughs> no. Well, good. And we'll just open it up. What about? What, do, I don't to know. Whom? Well, I don't know. I kind of want to pick Tom's brain because you, 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 what do you? I you deal with news. All day, every day, on a little program called The Day of News and Technology. It's actually a takeoff on an Arrows song <laughs> from 1979. <laughs> but, like, as somebody who deals with news, is there ever any stories? Oh, the days of news and technology. <laughs> Can I do Saw the theme Jason song Halley for Tech News today? Jam, Can I mate. do a song where every day... I, I do. I plug in lyrics of like what happened the day before. Yeah, you awkwardly be like, hey, Jack, it's a fact. Steve Skanofsky's out at Microsoft. <laughs> Who's going to replace him? <laughs> it's the day of technology. No uh, lie. When we would walk down to do Buzz Out Loud back in the day at CNET. 
Veronica Belmont, Molly Wood, and I would often make up lyrics to go with the A-Team theme. Oh, that's awesome. As so we give, want. give me an example of, of how that would go. Uh, I, now I have to remember the A-Team theme. Steve Sadowski just got axed. He don't work at Microsoft anymore. <laughs> Keep going, keep going. Awesome. It's good. I actually want to hear the entire newscast done that way. You're like, <laughs> what do you think of that? I as give it, us it, the your... song just lends itself to like pretty much any word you can think of. You also don't really have to rhyme it at all. Like no. you can just keep. If for some reason it's melodic enough that it just yeah. it just rolls. <laughs> so my question is, as somebody who deals with news, is do you get do you get any weird? Things or what is the weirdest level of news that you run across as you sift through the stories and make sense of it all for us? Well, see, that, that, that's interesting. I used to get weirder things than I do now because the whole way I approach gathering stories for Tech News Today is to find the stories that I believe are a cross section of what the audience is really into or wanting to hear about. Uh, and, and it's actually something that with several co-hosts I've had to discuss, like, this isn't about what we think are the most important stories of the day. It's not us preaching to the audience. This is, we should, we should try to identify what the stories that are getting all the buzz out there, what are the stories that people are talking about, and then try to bring a, an element of analysis and maybe debunking, depending on what the story is, to rumors, perhaps. So I, I've, I've effectively tried to cut out the sources of the weirder stuff because it's unverifiable. Uh, but, but yeah, I mean, there's, there's always weird, like technology rumors going around that so-and-so is going to do this. So-and-so is going to do that. That's not really the most interesting stuff. I think the weird stuff that's interesting are the stuff we like to put in the randomizer segment, which is our, yes. our, kind of, our, our, our offbeat segment stuff that doesn't fit in. And that generally revolves around, you know, crazy robotic stuff, bionic limbs, all of that sort of thing. That's the weirdest stuff I see. And, and so do you have a particular favorite? The promise of the future, because here's what I no, here's what I, Brian, I don't remember anything. I, I just it all leaves my head. Well, no, 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 I'm not, I'm not holding you accountable on that. But like, yeah. why are you pop quizzing him, Brian? <laughs> You're making him uncomfortable. <laughs> and I immediately roll over. I'm like, what I mean is, make up a really weird story. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. I wasn't saying an actual story. <laughs> no, like my uh, my question is: is do you find yourself? Uh, in any way embittered or jaded when because I do love the randomizer stories because they are you know there are all these delightful possibilities you know we got a hamster to eat three eggs and and poop out the answer to a riddle and uh, is there anything like do you just take no, everything with a grain of salt where you don't believe anything are you dead yeah. inside <laughs> I am I, as I admitted on frame right the today joy get snuffed out inside of you Merritt yeah I I have smothered my inner child no um I. I uh, I am very skeptical of everything that I read uh, because I have to be because there you know what I do is I build a level of trust with sources essentially right, right. so there's you know your CNETs your Ars Technicas and you know all right these guys generally get it right uh, and so if I do run across something that I'm like a little curious like could that be wrong I look at the author. Right, and then I, I have I've built up a, a pattern of like, oh, okay, Timothy Lee, I know I know him, he's good. Oh, Dan Gooden, he's trustworthy. Um, you know, and I'll still try to probe the sources, etc. But if it comes down to them saying I have a secret source that told me X, if the Wall Street Journal prints it, I give it a high level of credibility. It doesn't mean it's true, but I give it a high level of attention. If a blog I've never heard of prints it, I'm going to ignore it until I find somebody else who says actually, yeah, I can. I can, I can bear that out from my own sources. So you got, you got to do that. And then there's also these other, uh, the, these other blogs that, that come up with the randomizer type stuff where I'm like, okay, we can be a little softer on this because it's not the hard news. It's kind of the kicker. It's the fun story. But we still need to have like an actual scientist from, from, who, who's real 
from an actual scientific institution quoted or maybe some video. If there's video, we're golden because then it really doesn't matter if it's true or not. You can just be like, what a great video. Right. That's well, amazing, also, even yeah, if it's fake. The news item right, itself uh, becomes the fact that this, this video exists and then you, yeah, your yeah. commentary could be whether or not you think it's BS. I have an ultimatum for you, Merritt. <laughs> That's a very polite way to introduce an ultimatum. <laughs> it's about time. <laughs> All right. What would you rather have? Now, on Tech News Today, any regular listener knows that you have to, especially with high-profile companies like uh, I would name Google and Microsoft, but probably most notably Apple. You deal with a, a lot of rumors. You are very disdainful with uh, many times the, the rumors that will come in on, uh, let's say, translated sites from you know uh, countries that supply components like China and stuff like that. Would you rather have an element of your life that was all of those unconfirmed, just like seriously, three times a day, you get in your inbox, in your email inbox, an unconfirmed, my cousin who lives in China wrote on a blog who says that the iPad mini is going to be in 3D de debuting next month. Or just a feed of Bigfoot tracking activity from the hills of Russia. What, for the show? So there's the trade-off. Maybe one is a little silly diversion, but you can only have one or the other. So like the, the, you have an element of your job that is a, well, granted kind of like BS. Do so I still it, have Ars Technica and seen at the Wall Street Journal or right? Yeah, this yeah, is yeah, my no, only no, source is, to build you're not, the show. You're not compromised completely from doing your job. You're just trading one bit of nonsense for for right, the so, other. So the question is like here's the difference, right? Because on the one hand, like the Bigfoot tracking data, you will always have in a certain category in your mind of of amusing diversions of, of some silly nonsense that uh, that likely is just statistical noise uh, in confusion. Uh, but the other one will says be you. much. Well, yes, yeah, says me. You're right. Uh, or suggest. I see the Bigfoot. He <laughs> goes running around. Say boom, ba boom, ba boom. <laughs> a squatch. But the other though is is also very you likely. You don't even know who that character is. I didn't say his name before or after. <laughs> it doesn't. He's unnamed Russian three seventy two. No, he's Olaf. He's been on the show before. Okay, Everybody right. knows he's Olaf. Go ahead. <laughs> um, I make uh, how you say uh, the chopping of wood and uh, then a Sasquatch show. Uh, I bring you a big bag of soot. <laughs> <laughs> but the other, the other though, would be more interesting noise in that it is related to a field that is important to you. But the question is, and some of these, by virtue of of being random, are going to turn out to be right, and you will have had true insider sauce peppered into your inbox from time to time. But well, I mean, but, but uh, no, no matter what the data is, whether or not those rumors come through, and and and. Tom, I mean, th these are the ones that you uh, basically to audio listeners of Tech News Today, you do everything but spit on the ground when you mention them on, on the show because <laughs> you were by just the way, of the fact. I think that should be a personal challenge. We do want to see you spit on the ground, at least during <laughs> one rumor. <laughs> You're like, this story, I, I think I, <laughs> I grow up to be a big, strong newsman. I grow a beard. <laughs> and this story you bring me, Atua, I spit on this story. <laughs> Uh, so those guys that, that really, no matter whether or not they actually pan out, they, they really doesn't matter because, you know, they're they're pretty much very lightly regarded uh, no matter what in, in that process of reporting a new product. So it's either those super early, completely silly, 99.9% .9 completely incorrect rumors about Apple products or a constant feed of where people are reporting the Sasquatch in the hills of Russia. Which would you rather have? Honestly, neither one will be helpful in doing my job. So no, if, it, if it's they're related both to my job, your life. toss a coin. If it's related to my life, I'd much rather have the Sasquatch feed because that's incredibly entertaining. I, I, I love me some, some good Bigfoot lore. Um, and and that, that, will, that will make me smile. Whereas the, the, the rumors are useless. The signal to noise ratio, I mean, yeah, stopped clock is right twice a day, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, we only refer to those rumors when they get enough attention by people that you can't ignore them. And you have to say, all right, Digitimes is saying this, but remember it's Digitimes and nobody else is saying it. We try to avoid that unless it's really just everywhere. For instance, 
there was a big story from a French blog that iMac was going to be delayed until after the first of the year. We absolutely ignored it because the only source of it was the French blog that we'd never heard of before. No disrespect to the French blog. They may be great. They may have accurate sources, but we were like, we don't know that. We don't know the source. (laughs) We're not going to pay any attention to it until we hear somebody else saying, yeah, we're hearing the same thing. In fact, today... It came out that the sources who've been digging into this, like the CNETs and the Wall Street Journals, all said, no, there are going to be IMAX shipping at the end of November and early December. The only thing Apple is saying is that the supply might be constrained. And they said that in their earnings call. Uh, so so we just, I, I would just ignore the feed of, of rumors because that's like saying, oh, well, there can't. might be two diamonds in these large forced, two-ton trash to bags yeah, full dude, of rotting no, they, banana peel. They're, they're corrupting your feed, man. They're in your inbox every day. No mail route will save you from these rumors oh, and can speculation. Can I use mail route to get rid of No. 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 Okay. no not, not on this show. They That's, don't sponsor. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you dude. don't know what that is. <laughs> We've never, never heard of mail route and their amazing mythical spam killing powers. Speaking of sponsors... Brian, give me the time code, because I'll plug one in here. Uh, 3654. Those are my measurements. <laughs> you got two. Gentlemen, I lied to you when I said that I was tapped out on stories. I do have another story. How weird. UFOs. And I do mean legitimate UFOs. So a flying object that has not been identified. Absolutely. Exactly that has been spotted over the skies of Denver. Over Denver? Mm-hmm. It was, a, was it a dragon? A luck you dragon? Go ahead. If you go on over to weirdthings.com, you can take a look. Something at, to do uh, in Denver when you're at, dead? At, at the video. Basically, what, what's video? happening is there was a, a amateur photographer who would go up to a certain hill in Denver and would point his camera out and record... From, I believe, the hours of noon to two. At that point, and only when he looked back at the footage, did he see UFOs that were moving at a faster speed than his regular eye could see. He okay. slowed it down frame by frame and saw these UFOs. They, uh, the, the news report, for which we have linked on the weird things, uh, filmed it with their cameras. And now uh, they have also contacted... Uh, NORAD and the local uh, FAA and a few aviation experts. Now just, just real quick, so we're clear. This is the same NORAD that every year tracks Santa Claus, right? I just the same be- NORAD, okay. and they and, and and NORAD says that they have uh, no so they're record. Experienced. <laughs> they have, they have no record of of anything being in the area. The FAA says they have no record of anything being in the area. And yet, there it is, gentlemen. Now, why does this guy record stuff for two hours every day? I don't know. And also, when the next time that you, you see his arm, look how hairy it is. I think we found a Sasquatch. <laughs> oh, oh, my God. Minute. It sure is. It's amazing. Jesus Christ, sir. <laughs> Those really look like bugs flying around. <laughs> <laughs> in- <laughs> oh, b- bugs, Brian. <laughs> I posited on Weird Things that they're really drunk aliens. <laughs> really drunk high aliens. Well, really, yeah, I mean, really listen. drunk aliens. So so wait a minute. So he captured this, but then it was independently captured as well by KDVR. Yes. So so then uh, KDVR in in Denver went, to the went on out place. there uh, and and recorded it right next to where Heidi Hemat is uh, standing right now. On uh, for anybody watching live or uh, watching the video back, uh, they they recorded it, slowed it down, and saw the exact same thing. How well, do you answer that? Brian, <laughs> that's what's the so great about uh, about these things is that when you get reproducible results, and of course that's the first thing you want to see in any kind of scientific investigation of of any reported phenomenon is whether or not you can reproduce the results. And if you can, I mean, there are two things that are stated here, right? Which is he didn't see anything with his naked eye that he noticed, and then he you know sees these artifacts that appear to be unidentified flying objects going all around, which we see the same thing with orbs. When people snap photos, they're like, I didn't see no orbs, but then I snapped something on this foggy night with a flash, and now there's orbs everywhere. And then likewise uh, with um, you know rods, which, uh, which are just uh, orbs that are you know moving oftentimes. Skeptics will tell you 
that they're actually because of uh, their bugs flying across the camera and because of the shutter speed, they show up as, you know, blurs in motion. But we all know that they're paid off by the Illuminati. Uh, but yeah, man, it's like the look, Illuminati run by bugs. <laughs> the bug loop, the bug loop, the, 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 the Illuminati two electric bugaloo. <laughs> it's it's the lightning bug Illuminati. They uh, they want to illuminate the world with their butts. Everyone knows that's the, their their secret. <laughs> Turn on your butt light, <laughs> let it shine and let it glow. In our secret society, <laughs> we got it. Uh, I so, I mean, it. but listen, they don't really look like, I mean, like, uh, to the naked eye, when they go frame by frame, they don't necessarily look like a, a bee or or a fly or, or something. They don't look bug-like. You sounded like you're inventing a new character just then. They don't look like a like a bee. Like, a, like it's some they kind of... They don't look like the insects I'm going to name that don't look like them. <laughs> I, I mean, I'm just saying, this is what, if you, if you look... Listen, Brian, I am only speaking for the YouTube comments. <laughs> oh, is that, is that really? I didn't even think to look at the YouTube comments. Uh, a spoiler alert, they are very swayed. Uh, are they? Yes, they are. <laughs> or at least when I looked at them on, on, uh, on Saturday when I posted this. Well, let's see. I, actually, hold on. Now, all of a sudden, I'm realizing the top comment is, it looks like Sasquatch's arm pointing at the screen showing the UFO. That was not there. I made that joke independently. <laughs> I don't Turn know. Let me just, let me just put that light. up there. It was number one right, right there. I don't know, man. That's we, not... That's I did not write that or read that. <laughs> Oh my God! What if we lived in a universe where policy decisions were made by YouTube comment consensus? Like somebody proposed like a law. Up votes. Yes. Yes. You that sounds to- like a mediocre Cory Doctorow story. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, one where he's like, "I'm kind of sick. I'm not really trying, yeah. but I need to throw a short I don't know. Uh, Congress is YouTube comments, <laughs> right? Boom. There we go. I'm gonna put it up I'm free. Not proud of it, but it's done. They also, uh, Ron Paul is president. I think yes, yes. Ron Paul is president in this world. Oh, he's God. a robot, he's and he's run by Walmart. <laughs> uh yeah, bugs. They're bugs. It's a bug's well, life. I mean, way to way to play around with it, Brian. <laughs> way I to just, really have a good time. No, no, no. Well, I'm just saying. Just saying. You just gotta establish uh, a baseline. I I don't know why my my drunk alien uh theory uh in inappropriately drunk driving aliens uh now apparently that's right out we can't even talk about it <laughs> well i'm not i'm just gonna say it's not it's not out i'm just saying although i do like this idea of like um it's like a, a an alien college film where they all they come down they're like you know spring break on yeah. earth they're frat boys exactly they're shotgunning and they're what's right around there well, uh, it's none other than Coors Brewing Company. Well, hold on, hold Gold on. Colorado. Didn't all of their subsidiaries. And didn't, didn't Colorado just legalize weed? So maybe... <laughs> yeah. Why do you think they're there? <laughs> hey, man, we're from Xenon 12. We heard y'all just legalize weed. Like, Earth is now there, Amsterdam. <laughs> Hello, Earth, Denver thing. <laughs> hey, man. <laughs> Dude, you ever tried to speak to an Earthling on weed? <laughs> <laughs> we have unfathomably advanced technology to get after. Floor Mac's a floor Mac, but they call it a Big Mac. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I didn't go to Glaxner. <laughs> you know what they put on that shit? Ketchup. <laughs> uh, it's true. I've seen them. They drown them in that. <laughs> As opposed to blood. <laughs> like it's supposed to be. Like it is here on Florgnar. <laughs> <laughs> Amazing. I wish I could live in a... I wish we could vote things into reality. I always think it's curious that people are like, do you believe in ESP? I'm like, what does it matter what I believe? We can't vote it into existence. So it's like, you know, the question- imagine we had a system where you could, through your own monetary contributions, vote things into reality like Kickstarter or Indiegogo. Oh, but, but like with, for fundamental for laws of reality, where it's like you make a pitch 
So it's like some to who the dungeon master? <laughs> yes, <laughs> or as we call him, God. No, but I think there's a well. Hold on now. I think there's a right to say I believe something because maybe not all the facts are in the preponderance of evidence has not yet you know made it to become a law. It's still a theory, but I believe that that theory is right. That's part of science. Uh, it's part of the debate, the open debate of science. I just think it's I mean, the, a weird the belief. Well, the belief is, is a part what leads of you to pursue the, the evidence to to back up the belief, and then you change your beliefs. But but just saying you believe, do you believe something or not, is not an idiotic question. That's no, so I, if, I'm not uh, saying it's an you idiotic. Know, where's your one? head at? I just I just don't think it's a relevant one. It's like what does it matter? What I where's your head at is a song. No, but I think it does. I think it exactly matters because if you don't believe anything, you actually can't make any progress scientifically. You have to you have to have a hypothesis. That's your belief that you're testing. Yeah, but I I don't know. I think you're over. Hmm. Uh, hmm. Wait, wait, hold on, Brian. So, what, what is your point? Well, my my point was is that uh, the the question that everyone asked, nobody has ever asked me. Uh, hey, as somebody who has read more of this than I have, is the a preponderance of evidence that suggests that there is psychic powers? Like nobody asks, like, does the evidence support psychic powers, or or do you predict that in the next five or ten years we'll have a reproducible double blind study that that proves? That? They don't ask that. They say, do you believe in ESP? Which to me is way less relevant because you know the question is like, do I believe in the color red? It's like it doesn't matter if I don't believe in the color red. That doesn't make well, red. Okay, not how exist. about this? Right, right now there are several competing theories for the unification of physics. Is it, it you, the standard model is insufficient? Is it string theory or is it a holographic theory or is it some other? You know, there's lots of competing theories. Which one do you believe is the, is the right theory? Lots of physicists have a perfectly reasonable answer. I believe string theory will, will play out and become the, the theory that proves to be correct. Yeah. All right. So you're saying that, uh, that, the, that really asking if someone believes something is just shorthand for saying, you know, which do you predict will be kind of? Yeah, correct? I guess so. Well, I mean, in terms of when people ask, like, do you believe in psychic powers or something? What they are asking is if you are like them, theoretically, or or if you if if you are if you similarly are fascinated with this and hope that it will be true. To which, I mean, has always been the stated point of of this site and podcast that yeah, we yeah. hope all of this is true because yeah. we would live in a more magical world if this stuff were true um but that doesn't mean that we that we think that it is now or even is likely to be but we hope that's a cooler way to go through life than to I, just I be get like where you're coming no from, Brian, snuff you, out that right no, now I'm, well, and i'm certainly not saying that no one ever no. goes up, and, and it's not Brian's even the not preponderance of evidence. They don't UFO ask you, do you believe right? in yeah. something that actually is a reasonable thing to believe it or not, right? It's always like, do you believe in fairies, Brian? And you're like, no. no. Well, no, no. well again, I, you know. it's like, it's like uh, it doesn't matter if I believe in fairies. Or do you believe the earth is flat? No. It's like your real question is, are fairies real? But instead, by asking me, do I believe in fairies, then it's like, it, it doesn't matter because it's like my belief will have no bearing whatsoever yeah, on whether or not they exist. Okay, no, 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 no. But I do, I do, I do disagree with you that, that that's what they're asking. They're not asking are fairies real. They're asking if you or they could be asking. Rather, yes, Listen, many times uh, they are asking. This is if, this is all of our straw man to shape and mold in whatever way we want, so we absolutely. can have him. Do you say believe in straw men? <laughs> they're, they're they're asking if you are a kind of person who could believe in fairies. Yes. All right. They're My asking if, is, if do you, you believe in if ghosts? your mind is open to it. Yeah. Do you yeah. believe in ghosts? My favorite is I, I I do not believe nor disbelieve in ghosts. I have seen absolutely no evidence. I've never experienced anything. Uh, but I also don't see, you know, there's there's never been a rigorous proof against them. Have you have you ever been scared of ghosts though? No. Really? Never? You've never, like, at 2 in the morning, gotten the bugaboos and hidden under your covers oh, with the I, I've irrational? Oh, the bugaboos in dark places, et cetera, but that's just typical of I'm my species. I term. don't believe that ghosts are going to get me. <laughs> There's all kinds of things that are going to get me. Dude, well, like, and so what is it you're afraid of, though? Like, like there are times you just... Unknown. What scares Tom Merritt? And what <laughs> would you be most terrified no, if it wrapped on your window me. in Actually, four I had hours a question in at a dinner one night. Somebody decided to have a little conversation breaker, and they're like, what, 
what what's what was the scariest thing you ever did? And I was like r- answering this question. I'm scared all the time, like constantly. That's my life is, is being frightened of everything. Um, so it's not that nothing scares me. It's 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 that I'm not scared of ghosts. I think it's highly unlikely <laughs> that the thing that I'm scared of that's unknown is going to be a ghost. It's more likely going to be some guy hiding or an animal or just who knows what. But like I see, I could talk myself into getting scared of anything. Like when we stayed at the uh, the Wolf Manor with uh, with Brett Rounceville, there were brief moments when I was standing alone. You know, and it's like it's allegedly one of the most haunted houses you know in the, in the United States uh, over in Fresno. And uh, you know, going into it as we decided, hey, let's do this, and it was like five of us. You know, realistically, I was I knew that I very likely had more to be scared of uh, of a hobo stabbing me than anything else. But then uh, very quickly, man, when you find yourself alone in a room and you turn off your flashlight and you start to get oh, yeah. high, like, man, it's like, what's the line? Uh, I'm, I don't believe in ghosts, but I'm terrified of them. Like, I, I could feel and I, I love scaring myself and getting all wound tight. See, I, I, I feel exactly the same way in, in the same situation. I'm not I'm not pretending to be special in some way, but there but it's not ghosts that I'm afraid of. It's just, I, it's, I don't know what it is. It's unknown. It could be anything. Maybe it is a ghost. Maybe it's a werewolf. Maybe it's, it's a hobo. I, I, you know, I leave it open, but I'm still scared. Yeah. Hobo with a werewolf as a best friend. <laughs> a novella by Cory Doctorow. <laughs> the Wikipedia werewolf. <laughs> He's constantly Where- morphing. Uh, I don't know. Uh, the the werewolf is bought and sold by Enron. No, no. As the, as the internet types his profile, his powers change constantly. Why is adapting. Cory Doctorow Stanley? <laughs> <laughs> he gets the powers of stabbing things. The He's wi- stabbing things, man. The werewolf. The Wikipedia werewolf coming next week. Uh, all right, Brian, give me the time code on this. 5241. All right. 52. Gentlemen, would you like to make picks for each other? Yes. Uh, Tom, uh, I know you've been on the show before, but uh, normally we talk about things that we like or things that we've read, um, and we suggest them to the audience as if you did not know what <laughs> let's do picks on a podcast <laughs> meant. <laughs> Uh, Brian, what have you been up to? You know what? I'm reading, uh, man, I'm just continuing this kick on the human mind. As you know, it started with the rational optimist talking about the way all of our brains are stupid and we can't wrap our minds around statistics. And we, by the way, you know that you do, you do this biblical chain with every book. Yes. And Adam gave birth to Jedediah and then Jedediah gave birth. Yes. Uh, if I may, uh-huh. in the beginning, there was the rational optimist, and the rational optimist begat abundance. No, Be- farther back. Tales of the fourth grade, nothing. Ab- <laughs> abundance begat uh, Daniel Kahneman's thinking fast and slow, which begat where I am now. I just finished reading, um, the I think, Martin Lindstrom, is that his name? The guy who wrote uh, Biology, B-U-Y-ology, which uh, came out in like 2008. Spell. And uh, it was it's interesting because it's all about uh, the initial the first fMRI functional MRI tests about what happens in the brain as we become exposed to different brands. We, we think we prefer things because we like it better, but then all the ways that we are programmed and the, the small <clears throat> subconscious ways that stuff plays on us. And uh, it was it was good. It felt a little bit dated because I had I was familiar with a lot of the studies that were mentioned in it. But what's really interesting is the follow up I just started today, which is brand washed and the four words written by um, uh, Morgan Spurlock, uh, the guy who did Supersize Me, and he's got a, uh, a movie about branding and you know about the way we're manipulated by evil corporations and so on. But it's interesting because Brand Wash starts with uh, this is a guy who travels all over the world giving these keynote speeches about his studies on branding. And he went, wanted to go on a year long brand detox where he started off and he would not buy 
a single branded anything right down to if he was on an airplane, he could not ask for Coke or Pepsi. He had to not know what it was. He could ask for a soda and then just whatever he got was what he got. You know, if he, he couldn't buy uh, branded vitamin C. So instead he would just, you know, drink orange juice. And uh, it got really difficult with clothes that he had, uh, whatever clothes he bought, couldn't have any, you know, couldn't be polos or Tommy Hilfiger, no brands associated with them. And he lasted about six months and he got into this, this one moment where uh, his luggage got lost and he had to get on stage to give his keynote. And he had to buy a different shirt because he couldn't wear his filthy shirt that he's wearing. And that one crap, and it was a it was a crappy, you know, I heart uh, uh, Cypress is what it was. I heart Cypress shirt that he gave this keynote in in a seven dollar shirt. But like once he had cracked on that and he had he had broken his pure streak, it was like all of a sudden he was a drunk off the wagon and he uh, he went around buying buying everything, buying colognes and gifts and and. Big Macs and really? all this stuff. Anyway, but it's just interesting to see biology is very much a book about, uh, hey, look, these are the tools of branding and you should recognize they're being used in almost this kind of pro uh, this pro branding way. Whereas uh, obviously in the four years since then, we've we've seen a economic collapse and meltdown and people are trying to spend less money where all of a sudden so all of a sudden brand wash is very much this these are the tricks that are being used to manipulate you don't you fall for you. don't be brand washed but uh it's really interesting stuff i'm enjoying it a lot did i mean did did that tonal shift bother you did you did you no. enjoy it it, no. it less no, no, no. Uh, it's and keep in mind, I'm only a couple hours into it, uh, but it's it's very stark and very interesting. You could tell that uh, this is a guy who uh, has a field of expertise and has previously written a lot of books about how people can strengthen and position their brands. And that's his day job, and uh, for someone who does that, all of a sudden you realize that that song you've been singing. Not very popular in a in a world where uh, where you know everyone's trying to save money and make ends meet, and uh, it's interesting to see him pivot and be able to take that same expertise but give a a more populist message now. You know, it, it's funny when we look at at that, and and you're like, like, oh, well, look at how you know the the tricks of the human mind that they exploit to have you buy their things. When really, it's like. And not to say that, that all that isn't true. It's just a way of, of, of looking at it. And it's like, you know, otherwise, like these, these companies are people that want to cut through, like what Tom mentioned, signal to noise. You know, a yeah. lot of things are out there. A lot of things happen. The best, you know, the companies that, that can cut through, especially now when there are only more and more messages that, that uh, hit us every single day, is to find a way to remain a sticky idea. Well, and, you know? and weirdly, if we could talk about you know bra branding from a meta point now, that's essentially what we do with Scam School. Scam School is ostensibly a show about how you can be the the slimy trickster who comes in and steals everyone's free beer, and, and we present everything as being totally gritty and dark. But fully half the stuff we present on Scam School you can find in Cub Scout magic books. You know, it's 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 yeah. fundamental. It's simple puzzles, but it's the packaging that uh, and shown in a context that makes it feel underhanded and sneaky. That you look like a, a shifty near to well. Yes, maybe he mentions this in the book, but the, to me, the the evil, the so called evil of branding is not branding. Branding is actually a very good thing in a pure sense. It's it's a way of being able to know what you're getting, right? Sure. Oh, that 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 is a Coke. That is that I know what that tastes like, and I know when I buy that, that's what I'm going to get. What happens though, and what I think happens is brands are developed by somebody who has what they think is a quality product, and they work really hard when they're small to like to brand that, to 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 emphasize their brand, to deliver on that brand promise, to the point where that when they succeed and the brand gets very valuable, suddenly the brand is the value proposition. Yes. Yes. And the quality of the product no longer matters. Uh, and it's not, it's not such a conspiracy where people are like, yeah, so they try to rip us off by making, making the product really crappy. It's that they don't focus on the product anymore because they don't have to. The pressure isn't on the product. The pressure is making sure the brand stays strong and the product doesn't have to deliver because the product has to deliver when the brand isn't there to deliver the promise, right? And so that's where our psychology plays in where we're like, 
oh, but I know Starbucks is a good brand because all my friends say it's a good brand and I see it messaged as a good brand. And so I'm going to drink this and I'm going to say it's great coffee even if I don't well, and, really and you're gonna think believe so because it's, it's great not coffee. so bad that it can disprove it immediately. Right. Well, and not only are you going to uh, not only are you going to say it's good coffee, but you're going to believe it's good par- coffee. And part of the reason you're going to believe it is because of the the contextualization of, of what you've experienced up until then. At some, I mean, this is that's a really interesting point. And I'll be interested to see if he touches on that. Well, it's also I mean the funny thing about stuff with 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 declining product quality is that also you know. You are are dealing with very complicated problems, like especially when when companies stretch out from like a mom and pop store to you know several versions of that to franchising. You know, like all of a sudden you you don't have to decide. Well, how how do I make a good sandwich here in you know like Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania? Now it's like how do we get a reasonable facsimile of that sandwich? Uh, at any place where somebody wants to buy a franchise for it. Well, and essentially, like this is uh, what the the core idea of branding is scalability. How do we take this experience in in a one shop and then all of a sudden manufacture it globally, or you know, first statewide, region wide, then nationwide, then globally? Uh, and that's that's something that. Um, you know, you read when you read like a in the Plex by Stephen Levy, uh, they talk about like it's built in. Everything we do has to be scalable. We can't have a solution that works right now, but won't work when it explodes to uh, to a thousand percent growth. Anyway, I'll give you I'll give you a report next week on Brad. Watch, that's a good. I'm, I'm yeah, that's, so a, that's a very good call. All right. Um, Tom, do you have one or you want me to give you some time? No, I, I will. I'll uh, I'll choose National Novel Writing Month as my pick. Uh, we are halfway, well, two thirds of the way uh, through, and uh, I've been doing this. I've been attempting it every year. If anybody doesn't know what it is, the idea is to encourage you for thirty You're days. Too from late. November f- if you've never heard of it, huh? You're too late. It's only unless you can write a novel in eleven days. <laughs> no, you can actually. That's part of it. They're like, it's never too late to start. Go ahead and jump in anytime. I'm saying um, it's too late. Done. <laughs> Bury your dreams, kids. Hi, I'm Larry Naysayer, and I'm here to tell you National Novel Writing Month is a joke. You're too late. Forget about it. Maybe next year, kid. Good so luck. There's, there's I'm Larry pick. Naysayer. Thanks. There you go. <laughs> yeah. uh, it, it's 30 days of writing. The idea is like, if you've ever wanted to write a book of any kind and you've been putting it off and you need an excuse to get started, this is a bunch of people doing it all at the same time. The idea is you write every day and it, no excuses. Don't worry about structure. Don't worry about planning. Don't worry about notes. Just get words down on paper. If you do start at the first, you want to average about 1,667 words per day. Uh, but, but in all seriousness, they're like, yeah, you can start anytime. You can start November 29th and just like get writing. The, the whole idea is that they want people to start writing. Yeah. And it is, it is great. Now, I have, have the two books, the two fiction books that you've uh, published, were those both NaNoWriMo's? No, the first one wasn't. The first one uh, was just something I wrote when I was living in Austin. The second one, United Moon Colonies, uh, did come out of my first successful attempt at NaNoWriMo. Uh, well, I'll tell you what, it is super awesome, and, and it definitely is really inspiring to see. I mean, especially so many people that I know uh, participating in it. But, I mean, I'm joking around also if it's like, you know, the, the bury your dreams thing. Like, every uh, every month can be your novel. It can be, uh, you know, Rymo <laughs> on... <laughs> In, in December or January, whatever you want. Uh, but but I think g- having that structure is really, really fascinating. And doing it now when so many other people are doing it is definitely uh, definitely uh, really, really cool. And it's it's cool to see some of uh, – like uh, our, our friend Veronica Belmont is currently doing uh, a nano Rymo. And I just randomly – because I thought it, like she was talking about writing it. And I'm like, oh, what's your – main character's name just because that's always been an interesting thing whenever i've written anything be they sketches or short stories or anything like that i'm always at a loss for what to name my main character like i never it, it i always obsess about it way more than i think i should uh and so she was like and why why do you ask <laughs> and so, and so, and so she just, did I, she ever tell you did she give it up Anne, yeah, no, oh, her name Anne. Was I thought you said and. Why do you ask? No, 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 no. But like, I think it, it's cool to see like those kind of that like the the process of creation as everybody shares that uniformly amongst that community is a really fascinating thing. And I look forward, hopefully, if if everybody if people like what they read to reading what people write. 
Yeah, it, it's it's just a way of getting you in the habit of writing every day uh, and, and getting rid of the like, oh, I've got writer's block. Oh, I need to plan some things out. Oh, I, I don't know. It's like, no, just sit down, write 50,000 words in a month. Uh, and And then maybe you'll have a book at the end. Maybe you won't. Well, you'll certainly have a good start and you'll have more practice at writing than you had before because every single writer we talk to on Sword and Laser, when we ask them, what are your tips for writers? Universally, they all say write every day. Yeah. They may yeah. say all kinds of other things in, in a, you know, about other, other tips, and, but they all say you have to write every day. That's how you get better at writing. Well, and this is uh, it's one of those things where, uh, you know, people ask in the magic world, you know, because uh, uh, scam school is popular enough that a lot of young magicians get started and they're like, oh, how do you make it? Where do you get there? And it's like I tell all of them, I'm like, be fearlessly bad. Find a safe place to be bad and be gloriously, awesomely bad so that you can learn as much as you possibly can uh, to move forward. Because in many ways, um, anyone who, who gains a skill you gain it because you have this Groundhog Day-like ex, uh, experience where in the world of magic, you know, you get up, you do a show, it really sucks, you think, wow, what could I have done different? And then the next time you get on stage, it's like it's like you woke up and it's the same day again. You're going through the same show, you make the changes, and eventually you get good at doing that one thing. That's that's the whole the whole reason that we started doing the live streams, Justin and I, is because uh, we, we wanted a safe place to do our little internet shenanigan and and get good and and if if not good we're certainly prolific at this point in well i think we've 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 determined that now we could at least uh i mean tom you 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 could go to a, a an actual radio station but me and me and brian we felt fairly confident that we could get hired somewhere in north dakota to do a a morning a morning show yeah which is which is a big moment for us to realize and it's oh, only yeah. because no big you, time <laughs> So, so likewise, if if what you want to do is write NaNoWriMo, because you notice it doesn't say National Writing a Good Novel Month. No, no. It says it says National Writing a Novel, fifty thousand words. It doesn't say uh, you know you need to make someone cry. It doesn't say your character needs to have a transformative experience. It doesn't say that man needs to verse the wild or whatever. Instead, it's just like fifty thousand words. Just get them out Boom. there. Yep. Um, so there we go. 50,000 words in one shot, or as Andrew Maine calls it, a slow week. <laughs> yeah. Seriously, that guy puts everybody to shame. Um, what about you? All man? right. One pick for me. I've been talking nonstop about them. And Brian, I want to make you a challenge. Uh oh. You listen to a lot of audiobooks. I do. You are probably the person who has talked to me, uh, among, among people that talk to me the most glowingly about the Thrawn trilogy uh and so i you need you i now having uh, i'm rounding the final base on the last command okay, the, now, the third real quick real quick just to help trilogy. me out here just tell me tell me do i still have credit i mean like uh i was right oh no no no, no. This, well, we, we've gone beyond whether or not it's good i okay, love it good. now i'm going back to you and i'm saying you need to listen to the audiobooks i, I know i need to i need yeah, to you, you need to, i mean just like there's there are moments especially like in the the way that it's done and the way that the the uh, uh, it is it is beyond anything I've ever listened to in terms of uh, audio engineering in terms of uh, the the diversity of of the voices especially since we know these voices and so he has to do a reasonable facsimile without Good just doing an impression sure. um, uh, and then also you just you can't you cannot put a a for a fan a genre fan who loves Star Wars. You you really cannot replace just the element of losing yourself in a story with those hallmarks of the Star Wars universe, with with the swell of the scores, which they'll they they, they layer into it with the the trademark sound effects. Now, with, and, and this is specifically the 20th anniversary version on audio, yes. right? Yeah, no, I, I yeah, I don't know if they even have they they are the only unabridged versions on Audible, I do okay. believe. Um but just go ahead and and Brian, I need I just I need I'll you. It. I'll do it. I'll do it. I loved them. I love love loved them when I read them. Uh, and uh, yes, I needed I need another distraction. Re I'll really, the in. only thing that the only critique I would have about the books themselves is that it is obviously something that that was the product of a time that was devoid of Star Wars, and they wanted the like this was porn for Star Wars fans that like even to the point where he Timothy Zahn who wrote it um 
will have these touchbacks. Like whenever a character is in a situation that is similar to something that happened in the in the, in the trilogy, movie, sure. The original trilogy, sure, sure. They will spell that out, and it's like it's like he was writing on a, and this is not something that happened in in the story, but it's like you know he was writing on a big barge over a sand dune. Not unlike that one day after Jabba's <laughs> palace when they brought the ah! food. Um, and, that's, and that's something where it's like now that we are so much more familiar and now that Star Wars is, is not only canon for a devoted pack of zealots, but really, you know, such a larger cultural swath. Uh, we are so familiar with that that those kind of seem like overkill, but it's a product of its era and you just have to kind of take it for that. So, uh, but... Now it's amazing. That, the Last Command is the third one. I'm finishing it up now, and it's so goddamn good. Okay, so uh, I, I don't know how to get spoilery with this. Um, uh, at the end of this trilogy, there's a character that's okay. no longer... Yeah. Okay, don't mention it, though, because when you told me this initially, like I thought I was okay with it, and then I was not okay with okay. it after. But I'm just I got saying. more invested in it. I'm just Don't saying. mention this. Okay, I won't. Well, let me just, are you going to read the, the other two books after them? I will. I, yes, I, I will love to. But if for people who I am selling this on. Okay. I won't mention like, it. I, I won't mention it. But but I'm telling you, you got, you got to read the other two. And I'll tell you what, Timothy Zahn also wrote some other books that I liked a lot. He um he wrote uh, this. There's one, uh, The Icarus Hunt, that is kind of an adorable uh, space adventure. It's has the, the science fiction universe that it's set in feels very very star warsy but without the star wars license right so all the, all yeah. these names are changed they're all different aliens but you have this giant uh melting pot this stew of all different alien types and they all speak each other's language and uh, uh they got their own rules as far as hyperspace that goes on and it's basically um he gets uh this guy who's got a ship gets an unusual charter and uh finds some himself in with some cargo that's special and then some, some mysterious things happen uh on the plane and or on the plane on the, the the ship and essentially there's a mystery while in transit with this hot cargo that the guy finds himself with and that was a really fun one i really like uh if, if you dig timothy zahn one of his better ones i think is the icarus hunt that is awesome all right well ladies and gentlemen we talked about mount doom we talked about Tom's uh, horrifying decision uh, of whether or not to go with Bigfoot or or uh, nothing but unsourced Apple rumors. Uh, uh, Tom, thank you so much for joining us uh, yet again here. Uh, what would what would the average weird things listener, if if they are familiar with your work but not familiar with everything you do, what would they particularly uh, particularly like of your uh, your projects? I would guess uh, maybe some of the books, uh, meritbooks.squarespace.com, M-E-R-R-I-T-T books.squarespace.com, uh, where I have United Moon Colonies, the National Novel Writing Month book uh, that I, pu I self-published, Boiling Point, the breakup of the United States into separate countries, and the chronology of tech history, which is nonfiction, just a, a listing of uh, in chronological order of important things that happened throughout the history of tech. Yeah, man. Brand new. Hot off the presses. Yeah. Uh, so check that out. And then also, who do you got coming up on uh, Sword and Laser? Anybody cool? Yeah. Uh, tomorrow, we're shooting our next two author's guides. Patrick Rothfuss, author of The Name of the Wind and A Wise Man's Fear. Dude. And Paul Cornell, who has uh, written a lot of the Doctor Who universe that bridged the gap between the two TV series. So he created Bernice Summerfield, one of the most popular companions of the Doctor, who never has appeared on a television show. Wow. Wow. That's awesome. Dude, uh, by the way, so, I'm going to be up there tomorrow. I, I, I want when you guys come out of the airlock. I just want to walk by the back. I'm just like, like there's somebody else on the ship. Okay, okay, well, uh, right. actually, I want I want to walk by cameo. You got that oh, sweet see. mustache. Maybe you just get a mop. Yeah, you could just be the janitor. Just, I just want a mop. Yeah, you, wanna, you, wanna, you mop could be the pass. bartender. You could just stand behind the bar. <laughs> You could be a uh, oh, oh who is the guy on the uh, the love boat with the big mustache? Isaac. The yeah, there you go. Isaac. I'll be I'll be the Isaac. All right, uh, ladies and gentlemen, what else can I say? But in fact, it's been weird. And Brian, don't uh, I, I do one addendum? One addendum. But there is a snuggery update. <gasps> I, I don't want to say it. I want to leave it for, for an episode where we're all where we're all united. Oh my 
my God. Uh, but but we have had contact by a Weird Things listener uh, at the Snuggery. He has physical evidence. And I will guarantee I've read I've read what it is. And it will continue to keep this debate raging. Oh, that's great! Uh, raging, nice word. <laughs> it's a raging. Oh, listen, I, I know I don't, I don't, I don't mean, I don't mean to imply anything by that. <laughs> it will be, it, it will absolutely be amazing, and we will do it the next time we have Andrew on. Oh, all that's right, so that's good. it. It's been weird. Amazing. Do you know what the snuggery is? No, I don't. So, uh, Tom, there is a place in Rochester. <laughs> And uh, it's run by two young ladies, and uh, it's called the Snuggery, and they sell a service. Their service is that they will snuggle with you oh, for the healing hour. power of touch. What was that? The healing power of touch. Yes, this is the hearing, the healing power of spooning. Yeah. Um, and so forty-five we, we minutes of a double cuddle, on hundred bucks. All right. And we had we had a good conversation, and really. The entire lingering fascination with the snuggery is based on my completely half cocked <laughs> uh, statement, for which I've stubbornly stuck to that ninety eight percent of their clientele uh, are there is, on some degree on some level they're for sexual. Yes, they they, they derive a a sexual mm. component of their experience. At the snuggery, I would uh, for love which Brian to was horrified. This more, uh, my wife just had her first day at a new job, so I should probably go. Yeah, and, uh, you're gonna go I, get. You're gonna go get some snuggling. I thought we were gonna be done like a half hour ago. That's so. no, Cheers. that's right, that's right. Now we're talking about snuggling. So long. Yeah. That's bye. <laughs> Thank you very much, man. All right, no problem, man. Cheers. Pew. And he's gone. Good. Finally, shed that dead weight. I know. Anyway, we want to talk about snuggling. Come yeah. <laughs> Oh, it's two bros. It's two bros talking about snuggling, man. Get your snug um, on. Did you watch The Walking Dead last night? Oh my god, did I ever? Um, can can we talk? Yeah, I I I just stopped recording all this. Yeah, let me see. Getting a little, I'm getting a little 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 annoyed, Bri. Uh, I'm getting dude, a little cranky with this season. Yeah, you and me both. You and me both. It was uh, did, first of all, major disappointment with the governor. There's nothing about the governor. Like this soft, doughy politician, he ain't he ain't gonna rape Michonne. <laughs> it's like I want whether or not whether or not he does or or I mean like it's just like do we really think this guy's running a town? No. How is he running a town? No, it's yes, I agree. He just seems to like wander around and like poorly seduce somebody who is very easily seducible yeah no who has a track record of being easily seducible by 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 let's say less than than shining knights exactly uh, and plus um uh I, I i went off on frame rate it's like um and i'll be the first to admit that some of this is colored my biggest gripes with the governor come from the fact that I've seen who the governor could be and i can't unsee the the awesome character in the comic book and what made it so compelling in the comic book is you had this terrible, hateful, flying off the handle, uh, r raging human being, but that these people of Woodbury would rather live underneath his rule for the safety of this town. And they, they almost like the structure, even though it's a, it's a horrific, bloodthirsty mess. They will apologize. Mess. They will apologize for the actions of the leader to have his leadership. Right. First of all, so because the governor is not that guy— you also can't get that Woodbury as a result. So as a result, what we have is we have a doughy politician uh, who, who kind of meanders around. And as a result, we don't have a bloodthirsty Woodbury. And when they tried to freak us out with that scene, with the scene of the Friday night, you know, festivities, uh, that that fell flat and it seemed reasonable. And you're like, oh, no, it's like a boxing match, whatever. Now, on the flip side, on the flip side, um, so we have a Woodbury that's not nearly as black as it should be, right? Now, and, and also, to be fair, and it seems like a white town anyway. Um, <laughs> okay, I mean, I mean black-hearted. <laughs> in the comics, which, by the way, this is funny, because we are coming from two fundamentally different point of views. Yes. Uh, for which, and, and yet we're reaching the same conclusion. Yes. Because your point is, I've seen this realm in the comic books, and and so I cannot forget it when this is disappointing. Right. My point of view is 
make it completely different from the comic books. I, I, I really do not care. Trash the comic books. I mean, right. like it, it's specifically with this point, with this storyline, I enjoyed the storyline, right. but I do not think it is the holy text. I do not think it is infallible. No, I, I think there's I, I, agreed, plenty. Agreed. I think there's plenty that you could completely do. And I've enjoyed at, at many times. I enjoyed at most the things that have deviated the greatest yes. from the book. Okay. But um, I just think that, that he is uh, like my, my problem is just that he is fundamentally a boring, stupid character yes. for which I can't imagine being a leader. And uh, therefore I have a hard time when, when eventually we get to the point where he does something, which he already has, he's done something heinous. So it's like, it's not even like we have the tension of wait, is all this kind of stuff happening without his knowledge? Like, right. or, like, is he a good guy? And like, the Merle Dixons of the world who are just being gun nut weirdos who just like murdering people. Right. Like, is he going to rein them in? What does he know? What does he not know? We already, he already killed somebody personally. Right. And he has a wall full of heads. Right. So we're done with the worry, with wondering whether or not he has these depths. Right. So really he's shown us these depths, shown us no motivation why, and then just right. kind of floated back up to like, Hey, Right. I'm just a guy. Now, okay. I'm so just a guy who likes kissing girls. On the flip side, <laughs> <laughs> on the flip side, there's this other issue, which is uh, again, to me, what worked in the comic books is is you saw this brewing these two very different societies, and you you felt the clash that was gonna come, right? And on the one hand, you had you know all of Woodbury, and I explained how about that. On the other side, you had the prison, and the prison served two things. First of all, it was true safety for the first time in these characters lives in the entire run of the comic book up until then and because there's true safety or, or or the perception of true safety they're able to do things and make more interesting plot points that lull you you got interested in the relationships you got interested in uh, in in the jockeying for power and as they laid out political decisions on how they're going to run thing which all of a sudden when there was a tragedy that smacked you, it came out of nowhere, and it, and it hit you in the gut. We've never, ever found our balance in the prison. They have never made the prison safe. And that's the whole point of the effing prison. Is it supposed uh, to go I there? I disagree in, in terms of, of, of the lessons of the comic books, because it was always fundamentally unsafe. There was always the element that they hadn't cleared out. But, but okay, you know, no, no, every but, element but of they it. they thought it was safe, and they you saw this, wow, things are different now because we think we're safe. You've never seen that with the character. In fact, you would. Uh, they finally, the day they finally clear out the zombies is the day that Rick, you know, Rick loses his wife, and then a phone call happens and he doesn't even know who's on the other line and he's just like who are you where are you will you take us well, i'm so scared everything's so bad this isn't safe i'm in an effing that we just cleared out all of the goddamned zombies from and we've got all these fences and all this food and this generator power but i wanted will you take us to your magical fairyland it's like it's 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 well number one, number one the entire phone thing and i wrote it in weird things uh it's, it was a, I'm not going to say it was a waste of time in the comic because in the, in the comic, it came at a point where there was literally nothing but contemplation to happen Correct. because a it gigantic a explosion in the plot right. had just happened. And so this was, as we, as a reader are processing where we are in the story, it was a device granted a device. I, I'm not, I don't like, I don't like. The crazy, like, because if it's just you being crazy, it's basically like you being in a dream. Like, we just, it doesn't matter. There's no weight to it. Who cares? Yeah. And also, like, you know, like I said on Weird Things, we, it's basically you as a writer signaling to your audience, check out. Yeah. Just because I can't care enough to stay in my own real world. Why should you give a fuck enough to stay in our own real world? Yes. Um, yes. So, like now there's just so much to do there's and then and like it's just it's one of those things where like the characters are just so inconsistent that like you know why did merle attack uh attack what's it called attack Michelle? Uh, uh attack yeah. dude and girl yes like glenn and maggie glenn and maggie like why not? And then, like, why if Glenn and Maggie, like, number one, it was obviously easy enough to track back where they came from. Yeah. Because Michonne, well, I assume, follows 
their tracks like back to the prison again, by the end of it. That's one of my my constant complaints with the television show is they build characters that we believe and then they have them do things that we don't believe that character would do. And that's and that's that's constantly what they're doing. Uh and then I mean, just number one, the, the wasting of the of the, the the Merle and the governor just they break my heart weekly. Weekly, I just look at them and I'm like, man, I mean, you know, you have Michael Rooker on the show. <laughs> you know, like literally like all he's done is built a career by being a terrifying, intense badass. Like you can literally just have that guy on your show every week and just be a terrifying, intense badass with this like weird, screwed up sense of humor. Like that's God, just give him those kind of things to do. And then so like and by this point, we get that episode and he's just like randomly killing people and it's like you know like <sighs> yeah you want to know one of the craziest parts is i don't think when we did our discussion on frame rate uh we even talked about the fact that they found what's her name with that daryl found uh carol no one cares like no one like, cares. like nobody no cares, cares. they've given surprised. us a reason to care nobody cares nobody it was it was stupid stupid it's like you know it was funny because we were talking about it the other day or actually when that episode happened when the big episode where Lori dies happened uh, and by the way, spoiler alert, if you guys haven't picked Lori up on the last dies. 15 minutes of conversation. Um, but when we when that episode happened, we were joking because uh, somebody had said like, well, you know, she's dead. And it's like, no, I mean, number one, it's TV. If you don't see them die, if you don't literally watch them draw their last breath, they're not dead. Right. Uh, number two, I think we both agreed that that was how we were going to find Woodbury. Yes. That. She would have run out of the prison and, uh, you know, now she would have found refuge in Woodbury. And that's what brings our, our two camps together. That's not what happens. She's just apparently, I, I'll tell you what, really all we have to do is be thankful that we didn't waste the entire season. Look at this. Are you about going on Carol? hunting for Carol? Cool. Yes. Yeah. And that's literally my only positive element of this season is that through every stupid decision, uh, we have not we have not stretched it out like we didn't have the stupid phone calls like be Forever. through the entire sure, season. Sure, sure. Now keep keeps... in mind, keep in mind, uh, like I'm gonna say everything has been uh, I think for the most part really really good except for the last two episodes. Um, yeah, just the uh, the last two episodes. That has been awesome through the last two episodes, or no, no, it's been awesome up until the last two episodes. I thought the first what four episodes were of well, this season were like really really good. Yeah, um, I I agree. I just think that, like, to me, when I wrote about the season either being good or being bad, like, my good argument was all about Woodbury. It yeah. was just like, Woodbury is just such a fascinating idea. It is the defining story of The Walking Dead. It tells you everything you need to know about the human component of The Walking Dead is laid bare for you in the Woodbury story. Yes, you know, it is, it is like you said, because to me, I, I read, I read the comic book dichotomy slightly different that in the prison, we had a morally sound, uh, if even barely leadership, right. That was inherently kind of unsafe that we knew that like they were staying in a, in a facility that they couldn't really lock down. They couldn't really decide whether or not it was, uh, you know, it was, it was actually safe. The few people they find in there turn out to be just, you know, complete monsters themselves. Right. Uh, so there was, there were still these, these problems versus another area for which by any measure it is safe, you know, for, you know, uh, assuming you stay on the right side of the strong man, uh, but which is a completely morally corrupt leadership. And a, and a, uh, and so the question is number one, do you have to be uncorrupt or do you have to be corrupt to, to maintain order in this society? Uh, is Rick doing a disservice to his group uh, by holding on to any sense of of morality, right? Or is this just a, a you know a bad sample size where this guy's actually just evil and good at running a town, and this guy's really he's pretty good. He just hasn't had enough time, and bad things happen in the zombie apocalypse. Um, but like that's everything you need to know. Yeah, that's everything you need to know about uh about about the the human component of The Walking Dead, and it's just like I just wanted. 
God, I just, I just, I just wanted the governor to just be, and you know, I was talking to, to Brett last night. It's just like, after I watch it, I'm like, I think it's just, I just need to, I just need to put to bed I, that like, it's not lost. It's not Battlestar. I wanted it to be lost. I wanted it to be Battlestar. It's just not that show. And I should stop working myself up about it and writing, you know, 2000 word recaps about episodes that everybody just seems to like because there's zombies in it. And, uh, which by the way, that was one thing I didn't even write. Uh, I thought the action for the first time in a while watching the show, I thought the action was clunky. I thought the action, uh, yeah. didn't, well, and, and, and to be attention. honest, it's like all of the digital effects, the blood splatters are really, really pop uh, now. Like, like the digital effects are looking bad to me. Which, um, uh, like, like when he when he when he's stabbing, uh, when Merle's stabbing zombies, or when he slices in half, it looks like uh, like I have seen definitely better effects on film, right? Than I than I see on this show. Yeah, I mean, I I, I mean. I definitely noticed them. I wouldn't say that they really detract from my enjoyment much, but I mean, I just mean the way that, it, that that specifically this episode was shot. Like, I didn't really know where Michonne and Merle were in relation to zombies or relation to each other. You know, like there there really wasn't any sense beyond just like a very basic kind of stage combat sort of struggle. Yeah. Like, uh, you know, what the tension was, and that's something that even at its plot you know, a plot plotting shittiest. That's the fastball. The walking dead has never lost. Yep. Is their yep. action beats. They've yep. always been able to do two things better than anything on television by and large inter is horror action and gore. Yes. And they're still the best gore thing on television because nobody else will have that kind of gore budget probably ever in, you know, the history of uh, television because it is so successful and so gory. Right. But this was an episode where it's just like, that actually just kind of sucked. And then fucking Rick just walks not, out. Not as He's bad as like, last week's. Last week's was way worse than this week's. The action? Yeah, well, like last week's, it was so bad that I put it on, I put the show on probation in my heart. And this one, it was not bad enough to really, it just it just slipped a little bit on the rope this week. But like last week, I was like, all right, right, I'm. we've got a problem, you and me. Yeah. I mean... That nothing was like just like when Rick walks out from his cubby hole of shame and it's just like, hey, y'all, sorry I wasted the episode. I took, I took a shower and now all of a sudden my beard is trimmed really close cropped and nice. I have clean clothes on all of a sudden. Uh, now we're just nitpicking because we're pissed off. But anyway, no, I'm just again, final word on it. Set the rooker free. Set the Give a monologue. Set it free. Set it free. I'm talking about this one time here. For you, you squandered, squandered it. it You've died. Robots and robots. Um. See, this is the yeah. problem. See, this is my thing. All right. How about this? And and I, I mentioned like I was frustrated because all I wanted to do was for them to give Merle Dixon a monologue. I'm just saying, give him a monologue. And then meanwhile, who gets to have a fucking monologue about how their mother was fucking horribly murdered? Uh, it's Carol. So and be like, well, obviously they do that to illustrate that he's, you know, having a, he's he's forming a connection with with Carl and he's opening himself up. And it's like, well, how about this? How about you have Merle tell that story as the frightened person is uh, out there on the hunt for Michonne, yeah. he's trying to calm him down. Meanwhile, you see the silent Daryl in the prison with Carl, but you see him taking care of him, so he's actually like you know physically demonstrating through actions that he's bonding with Carl and that he's taking care of Carl uh and then you show the dichotomy of the difference between fucking Merle and Daryl by having the person who told the floor the florid story shoot the guy in the head when he disagrees with him and have Daryl uh you know obviously uh help and save Carl J yes okay done that's well played sir Fix. It's a new. It's a new show called Show Fixes with Justin Robert Young. Just Justin bitches about The Walking Dead like it's fucking Citizen Kane, and I understand that it's stupid. And everybody loves the show, and that's great. I love it. Good. It's fantastic that the show exists. A lot of awesome people were working on it. Uh, I, I enjoy the work of of pretty much everybody, but at the same time, I just I want it to be something that I don't think it is, and that's a Tell me what, problem. Uh, that's not what, a them problem because uh, they're doing fine. What's even harder? I'm freaking out. Right? <laughs> what's What's even harder is to watch the show after playing the game. The game's so good, man. The game 
hits these beats and puts you in the position of making these agonizing choices. Like it knows what makes the Walking Dead story work, and it really that's all Widow, right? Widow gets the yeah, yeah. yeah. Gary Gary Widow's the the coordinator for all that. Um, yeah, man, it's amazing. And uh, by the final, way, did you did you see the uh, the the big uh, skit that um, that uh, Tim League? Uh, or no, not Tim Lee. Uh, Tim from uh, Double Fine. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And Veronica did. No, I missed it, but I've I heard about it, and people it's are very, saying, very funny. It's yeah. hilarious. No, oh, that's awesome. I tell you, one of these days, I want to be in a position where I can write video game theme sketches for Veronica Belmont. I'll tell you one what, that would be days. great. That would be great. one of these days. Too soon. Uh, all right, man. Uh, I'm uploading the video now, so my bandwidth is going to crap. So I'll Cheers. sign off. Thank you very much to everybody. Who, uh, out, who joined us. Love you. You're totally awesome. And very Bye. tall and attractive today. See you tomorrow for NSF Dubs. <laughs> <laughs>